Right. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, we know it's Sunday and, and 10 a.m., so my heart goes out. I appreciate you so much. Today we're gonna talk about the immortal retrofuturism of mainframe computers and how to keep them safe. I will give you a small disclaimer. I am coming from, of course, the red team side, defensive security side, so this how to keep safe tips will not be as expansive as perhaps someone who is on the defensive side, but we will touch on it a little bit. So to begin, let me see how many pages. Yes. It worked. Okay, this is me. <laughs> it looks a little weird. It's all blown out. But I am Michelle Eggers. I'm a security consultant with NetSpy. I've been with them for a couple of years. I specialize in mainframe web application and network penetration testing. I have a background in accounting and finance, which is a little bit linked to mainframe because, you know, the financial industry is essentially held up by mainframe. We'll touch on that in a minute more here. Um, and I'm passionate about legacy tech. Uh, I like old things. I think they're interesting and cool. Um, and we are still using them, so it's important that we make sure we're still securing them. We can't forget to pay attention to the entire topology. All right, so this is our outline. We're gonna do a history debrief. We're gonna look at how it kind of started and some things that have changed over the years. We're gonna look at mainframes today, why people still elect to use them, what's special about them, what even are they. Um, we're gonna look at a few modern threats, some notable uh, breaches that have happened in the last decade or so. And then some things that we see in our pen tests currently, um, yeah, and I have a demo which is really cool that shows a real thing that happened. It's a little scary, but it'll be interesting. And then, of course, the tips to secure. Okay, so uh, before we get into the history and all of that, I want to know whoever doesn't currently work with Mainframe, anybody want to volunteer what you think Mainframe is? Give a description on it, just a sentence or, or two. Any takers? Yes. Okay, so we have, she said, a cluster of computers with sort of different uh, um, applications, use cases. S yes, close. Everything. You're on your way. <laughs> What's that? Everything's bigger. Yeah, well, depending. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, they're they're big systems. Obviously, she's yes, of course. Yes. I love it. Okay, great. Everybody's super smart. You'll get big gold stars. Um, <laughs> so mainframes are actually just computers, right? They're specialized computers that have insane processing power, storage power, their input output stuff, it, it, billions of trans transactions a day, literally billions. So. It's not something like a quantum computer where you're having a highly uh, complex tra uh, transaction that's occurring. They're more simplistic, but they have to be incredibly precise and very, very fast and happening in tandem at the same time. Happen they, the parallel sysplex makes this possible. Um, and they have unique operating systems like, uh, you know, IBM Z, right, and Linux. So very cool. You're not going to find Windows on a mainframe. Just, I, ho I hope not. Please don't. <laughs> Um, don't do it. Um, so let's look at a few myths versus facts. Something that has been fun for me this week is this first myth is something I've had to fight with people uh, basically every day on. They're like, oh, mainframe, oh, that's like 1960s AS4000. And I'm like, no, no. Uh, they have continuously evolved, right? They were some of the first systems to introduce virtualization, um, built-in encryption. They're continu I mean, there's more things coming out all the time. There's real-time AI inferencing. There are new things coming out next year from IBM. I'll tell you a little bit more about that too. Um, but they're not locked in the past. It's not like this green screen terminal from a 1980s movie or this image of this woman in this room with, bas that's basically one computer in the entire room. Um, we're way beyond that, okay? Another myth is that cloud replaces mainframe. Um, due to regulatory compliance reasons, this is impossible in many scenarios. Also, it's kind of expensive to move off of the mainframe. So that's another reason why if you, know, if you have um, a use case for it and you've implemented it, it kind of behooves you to keep it running because once you have it, it's actually pretty inexpensive. It's less expensive than cloud in that regard. You can also use them to host your own virtual private cloud, which is nice. Um, and then hybridization. Okay, so if you're gonna look at cloud and mainframe, 
it's not going to knock mainframe away. You're not going to replace it. But we are seeing more and more cases of hybridization where certain applications and functions are in the cloud, right? And there's, you know, just API calls or whatever making these things possible. Um, oh, yeah, and then I like this, this ELT, that is extract, load, and transform. So that's a way of getting your data off of the mainframe into a different environment so that you can do more analysis, right? Love it. Okay, and then another myth is it's just too specialized. No one knows what it is. Nobody knows how to do it. There really are literally maybe like five to ten mainframe hackers in the world. Um, so that's real. That's true. But there are moves underway um, to rebuild that workforce. It sort of took a hit in the mid-90s to the early 2010s in the staffing. The funding went down as far as, you know, building people, bringing them into the workforce. Um, but I was actually, I was at SHARE, which is like one of the biggest mainframe conferences that happens in a year. They do it twice. And I met a lot of people that were early career professionals that are, you know, in college and they're learning COBOL. And we're like, really? Oh, that's great. Um, they're becoming these sort of system programmers in the mainframe environment. There's, there's money going into it now because they're still being used and there's still innovation happening. And people kind of woke up and said, oh, oh, they're not dead. We have to keep going. So... Um, oh, and then this Watson X uh, code assist, that's, that's a cool feature that's coming out. And it basically just means you can take your COBOL and use these tools to help translate it into a language like Java or Python. It's a lot easier to find developers who are specialized in those languages. It's much more common than someone who specializes in COBOL, even though we are rebuilding COBOL people. So, all right. I love old pictures. I hope you do too. Brief history. Um, sorry, we need these lights down. It's all washed out. 1937. Okay. We've got... US, U.S. Navy Bureau of Ships, pre-mainframe technology. These were not digital systems, right? We're just talking about analog computers, mechanical calculators. These are for like gunnery calculations, uh, navigation. This is very military. This is pre-World War II stuff, um, but it's sort of like the, the bones where it began. This is where we started seeing innovation in this area. 1951, the Eckert Mockley Computer Corporation. They made it possible for businesses to now get this technology for their own use. It was no longer simply relegated to government. However, it was the UNIVAC system. That was for the census. It was 1950 census. And then they rolled out the UNIVAC in 1951 to help process that data that they pulled in that year. So really cool. Uh, time marches on. When is this next one? Yes. I, oh, I love this one. OK, so unified architecture was a major achievement. Um, Previous to the unified architecture, <clears throat> you had, let's say you had several different types of mainframe boxes. They could not speak to each other. They didn't have, uh, you know, similar software or even the language wasn't quite the same. And so you'd have to have a person trained up on each one or different people trained on each one and they could not work together. Um, but with unified architecture, it changed all of that. And now you could have, you know, a few different types of machines and they could communicate together. Really nice. Um, and then, of course, the vacuum tubes were replaced by this, uh, sorry, the solid state technology. If you have vacuum tubes in an earthquake, um, that's, that's bad news. Like, it's not going to live. So <laughs> it got a lot better. 1970, the innovation continued. We had ma magnetic ferret cores replaced by silicon drive memory chips. Uh, virtual memory was introduced, and dynamic address translation was also introduced. So as we're seeing, mainframe is really pushing, right? It, it's not lagging behind. It's constantly sort of at this parallel level uh, with innovation as, as, along with other technologies. It's just maybe not as talked about. 1991, the saga continues. This is great. This guy, uh, Stuart Alsop, he was, <laughs> he was like a talking head, right, for, for the technology. Um, I think he like wrote new, newspaper articles or something, but he said that mainframe would be dead, that it would be sunset. The last one's going to be unplugged on this very specific date, and that was published that date. He, he like stood on that hill, and he was very much wrong. Um, because as we can see, mainframe is still being used, right, by finance, by military, healthcare. Um, if you use your debit card today, that transaction touched a mainframe. If you have ever been to a doctor or you go to a hospital for something, your information is in a mainframe somewhere. It is. So now you know. <laughs> and then we've got the new developments coming along. Something cool. Uh, so. There's already AI on the, I, the Z15, 
Um, but this next coming year, IBM is releasing a new box that's going to have more increased capabilities. And what we're going to see is the, the real-time inferencing is going to step in in such a way that if there's fraud, right, so this actually happened in my family pretty recently. Like someone's at home and then they get a call 10 or 15 minutes later. Hey, are you at Legoland? Did you just spend $800? No. Okay, well, we're going to cancel your card and reissue a new one. It's this whole process. And then that company has to eat that cost because you as, you know, the account holder and there's fraud, you're not going to pay for that. Hopefully you shouldn't pay for that. And then are they going to catch the person who did the fraud? Likely no. So these companies are just eating all these fraud costs constantly. Well, if they can catch the fraudulent charge as it's occurring instead of, you know, even five minutes later, it's going to really reduce that cost, that inconvenience, having to get a new card. I love it. All right. So why do people use mainframe now? Why do we care? There are three reasons. You'll hear this acronym in the mainframe community. It's kind of like sales talking points. But reliability, availability, and serviceability. So if you're looking at the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ, something like that, they have to have what is called the five nines of reliability. So it's 99.999% uptime. They cannot have more than five and a half minutes of downtime in a given year. They cannot, right? And so mainframe is able to do this. It's got, well, sorry, I go through. Let's break out the slides a little more. Built in redundancy across your hardware levels, your input output paths, your power supply. Um, you've got error detection correction. You've got these machines that are so robust, they can withstand up to seven magnitude earthquakes, right? The vacuum tubes are gone, they're strong now. <laughs> uh, availability, right? We want to make sure that the machine itself, Beyond it just being strong, you can still actually get your data out of it, and it's accurate data at any given time, right? It's available to you. So you've got transaction rollback, checkpoint restart, complex job scheduling. They have 190 configurable cores in this one specific example, the uh, Z15, right? So you can basically finely tune your machine. You make like a bespoke system for yourself. Um, basically out of the box, you can start tuning it and fitting it to your specific use case. And again, with the unified architecture, they can all talk to each other. So we love it. And then the serviceability. This is actually one of my favorite features. Um, they're modular by design. OK, so and then I mentioned parallel sysplex. It means if you have a workflow or process that is relegated to one LPAR, one logical partition, right? It's like the virtual uh, segmentation within your mainframe. You can just swap those workflows over to another section of your box without any interruption, without any issues. So if you need to change a card out or you need to do some kind of repair, the machine itself never has to go down, ever. You just move the pieces you need to move when you need to move them because they're so modular. It's intentional. Um, you've got the in-depth logging for problem solving, on-site, accessible for repair and maintenance. So I live by a Google plant, right? And, uh, you know, they're just, what is the cloud? It's just other people's computers. We understand this. So I'm driving home and it's dark and I'm on the freeway and I can see the plant kind of over near the river. And there are all these police cars and a couple fire engines, an ambulance, and all the lights are going like this. And then keep driving, like, what's going on? And then the road to get to the plant, same thing. It's blocked off. I don't know what's going on. If your data is there, are they going to tell you? We're like, oh, well, that's just one region. Well, what if there was, I mean, I don't know if it was a, a, a physical breach or if there was a fire, or if there was some other kind of problem. And they'll never tell you, like, well, oh, well, it's redundancy. We have different regions. Okay. What if there was a coordinated attack against multiple regions at the same time and they just so happen to be the regions that your data are stored in? Something to think about. If it's on site and you have incredibly sensitive business critical data, and you can protect it with your own security. You know if there's a fire. You know your organization knows if there's some kind of physical breach. Um, you're gonna you have a better uh, just you have more insight into the security of your own systems. You're not you know hoping Azure's gonna call you and say, hey, somebody broke in and started a bunch of fires and hopefully it didn't affect your stuff. So, <laughs> and this is this is I love this. Okay, so this is a little demo. Oh, I wonder if it'll play. Oh, I wish it will. It may not. Darn. Well, basically, it's not going to play. They do this testing. I'll just simulate. <laughs> they just simulate really hard. 
<laughs> and they simulate a seven magnitude earthquake. So in New Jersey about eight months ago, there was a 4.5 magnitude earthquake, and there's a campus near there. I mean, the earthquake went up the coast as well. It affected a lot of places. Um, there is a campus with 200 mainframes, and not a single one was affected. There was no damage whatsoever. You want to start an earthquake in your server room and see how it goes? Uh, probably not, right? Yeah, yeah, a little bit scary. Mainframes can do that. They're literally built to do that. So apologies for the lack of the shaking. I can show you later. But yeah. <laughs> All right. So. We've gotten a little bit of an understanding about why people care about mainframe, why they use it, what are the benefits of it. What are the things that can affect it? What are we scared of? Why do we need to think about the security? So one of the big things that affects mainframe are the integrations, right? We, we see a lot of uh, entry into the mainframe environment, not by not starting at the mainframe level, of course, but with things like web applications that connect to it or just the general network, or in, in this case, even it was the Wi-Fi network. So the TJX company's data breach, payment card data breach, 45.7 million user cards were affected, exfiltrated. This is a weakness in the wireless network. That's how that one kicked off. We're gonna see a trend here. Heartland payment systems breach. Double the last, 100 million cards compromised. This was at the hands of a global cyber fraud operation. Okay, and this was a combined attack of network and application vulnerabilities. Then we see the Equifax data breach. Okay, this was now 147 million users exposed, which just goes up every single time. It's worse every time. And this instance, it was the web application that provided the initial foothold. And this one is a little bit harder to find information on. This is the Logica data breach. This was in Sweden and it affected the government. Um, and it was so bad and word got out that the government just published the documents. They just put everything public. They said, just here, go ahead and find it. You can find it if you want to. Uh, it's in Swedish, but you can find all the documents about this. Um, this was initial access via the FTP network, so unencrypted protocol, okay. Uh, <clears throat> the hackers use something like Hercules, which is an emulator. I use an emulator in my testing. I use X3270, but I tell you this to say it's not that hard to get some of these tools to start getting into the places that maybe you shouldn't be getting into. Um, this attack specifically leveraged some zero days, which may be a little more difficult to, you know, make happen, but they were based on default configurations. Right, so this is something that is easy to fix and not have in your environment. Please, if just as soon as you have something new, turn off your default configurations. Change it as soon as possible. Uh, 120,000 usernames stolen from RackF. RackF is like a security management tool in the mainframe environment. And the guy, you know, guy, head guy who was in charge of it, he was in Cambodia at the time, stole a bunch of money. It was, uh, it was very bad, it was very bad. And the entire government made all these new policies specifically because of this, this breach. Okay, so next up I'm gonna show you a demo. I'll give a little information on it. Um, what you'll see me doing, hopefully you'll be able to see it, is I'm authenticating to an LPAR, to a logical partition, right? Assume that the endpoints that I navigate to have already been enumerated previously during the engagement. So I'm not gonna, you don't see the enumeration part in this demo, but you'll see me sort of navigate to some endpoints. That's why. Um, the user I am that you'll see uh, is a lower level user. This is not an admin user, right? So of course it means there are specific resources that should, they should not be able to access. Okay, so the goal of this hack was to try to access um, of course, more privileged information. So, okay, and we're up and running. Okay, so this is me logging in. We've got TSO here, right, ISPF, and then now you're gonna see me begin to access a command line utility, which is a Unix-like feature within the mainframe environment <clears throat> through OMVS. All right. So it's, if it looks familiar to you in Unix space, you can just use your similar commands, right? So I'm gonna navigate to this opt secrets location. I'm gonna see what's in there. I'm gonna list it out. We've got a readme.txt and an SSH key. 
We're going to cat the readme.txt file. It says, this is the SSH private key you need to log on as an admin, do not share. Well, can I just cat the SSH key and just maybe access it anyway? Um, no, permission denied. Game over, right? Wrong. I used the same IP that the LPAR is on and just navigated it to it in the web browser over 8080, right? Um, <clears throat> again, we already had the endpoints enumerated, okay? So this specific location, the requests that are generated pull information um, from the mainframe, right? So you just open up the network tab and you can look at the requests that have made and maybe modify it and see what happens, okay? Um, so I'm generating the request. It makes a post request that pulls information from the mainframe. All right, we're going to crack that open. You don't even need to use an intercepting tool for this. You really can just use the network tab in your browser. It's a little bit insane. Um, so in the message body, there's a request for a specific file. Modify that to point to what was disallowed earlier. Keep in mind, I have not authenticated. This is simply in the web browser. Okay, got a 200 OK. That sounds promising. There's the endpoint I went to with that SSH key. Um, well, let's see what's in the response. There it is. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so this, thanks. <laughs> this is a real, this really happened. Um, I will just say within the past year to be somewhat vague, and it was not an SSH key, but it was definitely some very, very private information, completely unauthenticated access, um, not even on within the mainframe emulated environment, just, just over the browser. Um, so this is why I'm saying, we need to look at the entire topology uh, and make sure we're investigating the integrations with the mainframe because people say, well, mainframe is it's older, it's safe. Yes and no, all right? So we've talked about the integration ones. What about the mainframe itself? If you're just looking at the mainframe, like we're going to stay in this little box of the mainframe, is it safe all by itself? These are things we find on a regular basis within our pen tests, okay? Local file include, we find insecure Insecure tr pro protocols all the time. There's so much 23. It's, yeah, um, unauthenticated access happens. So there have been instances where I will begin the authentication process and then back out of it, not complete authenticating, and I can still run kicks, CICS commands, um, or you know, run Kims, things like this. Which you should you should be authenticated to run these. Um, so we do find this a lot. Uh, injection, SQL injection into DB2 databases, uh, JCL job job control language injections or rec scripts injections. If you're able to use these when you're not supposed to, you could delete, modify, erase entire data sets. Um, bad news, okay. And then we do see security misconfigurations. I, I don't see a lot of default credentials, thankfully, but it does occur. Weak password policies, often I will see um, They'll allow mixed case passwords. So let's say you're supposed to have a cap, like your actual password is capital this and lowercase this and some numbers and whatever else. You can switch the case around and do whatever you want and we'll still accept it. <laughs> so it's like, don't do that. Um, and not using external security management tools like RACA for top secret. Thankfully, most shops that have mainframe are implementing these things. Um, but it's just as, as a safeguard, as a, you know, just make sure that you're using these, these things. Okay, and then now the promised ways to secure <laughs> from the blue team side. Properly configure your network topology as a whole. I can't stress that enough. Please, mainframe is not its own weird thing off to the side. It is part of your stack. Treat it as such. Um, make appropriate use of your logical partitions. Make sure if a user has access to LPAR 1, they can't also somehow navigate to LPAR 2 and 3 and 4. Um, your regions, your ESM tools, let's see, disallow, again, disallow unencrypted protocols, secure with compliance. Uh, the CIS benchmarking is really great for con regular auditing purposes. And then the DISA STIGs, these are your Department of Defense guides from NIST. I've used these on a test. Um, I've actually, this is really nice. So I had a DB2 test where it's basically SQL based and they have whole lists of commands you can run to check, okay, well, if I run this command, can I access this when I shouldn't? If I run this command, can I elevate my privileges and so on? And I'm like, this is, this is great. I love this. <laughs> Very helpful, helpful tools. Um, secure with ongoing reviews. This is real basic stuff that everybody should be doing regardless of its mainframe or something else. Audit your identity and access management on a regular basis, right? Establish recurring audits for all features and do recurring pen tests. 
I love a good internal team, literally. Like you, you're closer to your stack, you're rolling out new features, you sort of understand what's going on and you need to be there, right? Uh, but I, you know, I am biased again because I'm third party pen tester, which is, I think is incredibly important to get fresh eyes on your five minutes. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna hurry up here. <laughs> fresh set of eyes. Um, not having the source code, being you know somewhat unfamiliar with the environment, and then getting in and just gently breaking it, so you can help the company fix it. I think is really really nice. It's a special place to be. Um, I love it. So again, what have we learned today? We're going to cover it real quick in a few bullet points. Uh, mainframe is not going away anytime soon. Okay, please keep paying attention to it. Uh, we li we rely on it globally to support finance, healthcare, government all of these critical industries. Okay, so we need to keep securing it. There are more possible vulnerabilities now due to the prevalence of integrations. It's just gonna keep increasing. Uh, but if we work together, we can combat it. So, thank you so much for coming to learn about Mainframe. Stay connected. <laughs>